Persian era from that flow, the 19th and 23rd Psalms. And then we went into that, that huge middle part of his life, encompassing several years when he's on the run, when he's endangered, when, when he just goes through emotional breakdowns, depression. I mean, the whole just kind of dragging bottom in life, uh, just a difficult time. And some of the richest psalms come from that. But now the turning point is the death of his nemesis, his arch enemy, Saul, at the hand of the Amalekite and the Philistines, that David is catapulted into the promised position of being king. And this evening we're looking at those psalms that are the bridge between uh, David before he's king and David as king. And, and as we'll see tonight, the 132nd Psalm, we're really not sure. We're not sure whether David wrote it at this moment to show his pedigree, how he grew up. We're not sure if it was written after his life, looking uh, back and, and extolling the king. But we do know that the 132nd Psalm is about King David. And if you open there in your Bible, and as you open there, we're opening to God's record of the life of David. Never forget that God inspired, uh, though he used people to write it down, God inspired this book. Uh, that is, by the way, I repeat it every week. Uh, I, it was interesting, we had the youth ministry assessment team that came last week and they interviewed, I think, 40 of uh, our young people and youth leaders and adults. And they said one thing they found is uh, that, that the people of Calvary think the Bible is very special. Well, I mention, I know you already think that, but I mention every week because that's what we're losing in America. Uh, the Bible is diminishing. Basically, uh, the Bible's on the screens. People don't carry them anymore. If they need one, you can look it up on your pocket device, but who would really need one? I mean, you know, it's there. We believe it. It's kind of in the background. And it's kind of been lost as something that is an integral part of daily life. To, to surrender a copy of the Bible for a digital one that, that I can get anytime I want if the batteries don't wear out and if I, you know, if I don't lose this and it drops in the lake or something. I mean, it's amazing that people actually are surrendering something that people actually died to possess. I guess I'll never be able to give up my Bible because I remember the looks and the faces of the people in Eastern Europe after the government took their Bibles away when we gave them one Bible for a whole church and they cut it up into pieces and they all took their piece because they couldn't believe they actually could hold in their hands God's Word. So you and I are looking at and, and, and studying God's Word. But this psalm, by the way, if you look in the 132nd Psalm, look right under what, Psalm 132. I'm not sure what Bible you have, but it should say something like Psalm 132. Then my Bible just has a little kind of like an editorial comment. It says it's uh, about God's dwelling in Zion. Then the next thing it says is, a song or psalm of ascents. How many of you have that? Okay, got the ascents thing. Okay, how many of you could stand up and tell us what that means? Don't do it, but I mean, how many of you could? Remember, comfortable, well-adjusted Americans, we just read for progress. And so if we're reading, we read that. And that's what it says. Don't know what it means for sure, but we're just going on because we want to check the box. But a psalm of ascent, I know most of you have looked it up. We're, we're a collection of 15. If you back up, the first one is in Psalm 120, 120. That's the first one. And they go all the way through Psalm 134. So that means there's 15 of them. Now, there are many ideas of where these came from. We do know that they were vital for the Jews as they worshipped the three times a year. It says in, in uh, uh, the, the 24th chapter of Exodus that three times a year they're supposed to come up and come before the Lord and worship the Lord at the feast. Unleavened bread, Passover, the feast of uh, first fruits, and then the, the feast of the tabernacles or ingathering. And so those, th those uh, three feasts were so important and so as they came up, ascended to Jerusalem, uh, they used these. We're not sure just how. Uh, one idea is that they used them at stops, kind of like Canterbury Tales talks about the little stops that people made on the way to Canterbury in the Middle Ages. Well, the Israelites had different places where they would stop and look at Jerusalem and they would read these and celebrate. Other thoughts are, and today if you go to the Holy Land and, and come up from the city of David to what is the platform upon which the temple was built. Now the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa are there, but the, those were built as victories over Christendom, so that's why they're there. But if you take them away, you know there was something special about Christ under them, and there was. It's the, the temple of the Jews in the place of 
day of Pentecost. That's why they built those two things. They always build mosques over triumphs over Christianity. So if you see a mosque in the Holy Land, you know it's over something important. But if, if you took that away, the temple would have been there. And carved into the bedrock of the Temple Mount are 15 long steps. They're long. You can't take them. You know how you climb up steps or you, you, you run up steps? You can't run up these. They, they are about three feet the, the uh, space between one step and then going up to the next one that's three feet. So you can't, they're monumental steps. You can't run up them. And they were made to have tens of thousands of people at once go up one step at a time. And they would stand there and they would chant these psalms or sing them. And this is one of them. This is the 132nd, which would have been uh, about the, the 13th of their steps upward and then 133rd and the last one, the 134th. But where they came from, we're not sure who collected them, but it's very possible Hezekiah did. If you read about him in 2 Kings 20, um, the Lord extended his life 15 years. If you remember, he was dying and he cried out to the Lord and said, please don't let me die. And the Lord says, okay, I'll spare you and I'll add 15 years. And it's thought that the 15 Psalms were put together by him and as a reminder of the extension of his life. But wherever they came from, there are, there are wonderful worship relations to it. But look at the 132nd Psalm because this Psalm is an explanation of David's habits of his life, or better yet, his resolves of his life, the things that he chose to do as a young person. And it, it was the, the resolves that fortified him for Goliath and for, as his youth, and not getting proud at being king, and which fortified him for running all those years for his life, and then it fortified him to be the king. So we could call this 132nd the resolves of David's youth. Now resolves are decisions you make that aren't just passing, that you remember, that you hold on to, uh, that, that you choose as, as the moral fabric, the, the, the deep-seated choices of life. That's what a resolve is. And David had some resolves. And, and this 132nd Psalm, whether gathered by Hezekiah, written by David, or the Holy Spirit inspired someone else to do it, no matter who got it on paper, it's a record of how David started walking with the Lord Listen, as a young boy. That's what resonates with me. Uh, David was, was from his youth one who sought after the Lord. It's a wonderful truth. This psalm can be placed either at the start of David's walk, right after he was anointed king by Samuel. Do you remember that first Samuel 16, 13, David? Samuel came looking for uh, Jesse's son, Jesse brought all the boys but David because he really didn't think David was worth bringing out, which shows how he thought of him. David was, was blocks, if not further away, out in the hills of Judean uh, wilderness watching the sheep. And, and Samuel looked him over. He eyeballed all of Jesse's sons. And it puzzled him. He said, are they all here? He says, because the Lord hasn't picked any of these, and the Lord told me he picked one of your sons. And the Lord doesn't make mistakes. Have you made a mistake? Have you left out one of your sons? And Jesse goes, yeah, him. I would have never picked him. The Lord picked him, that one out there. And that, it could be David wrote this, uh, maybe what his dad didn't even know about him, what his brothers didn't know because he was overlooked. But whatever, it could be there as he looks back and remembered God's hand in his life. But, but however we got it, this 132nd Psalm captures David in his heart for the Lord. So, with that introduction, let's read those 18 verses. And you got it? Let's all stand together. And we're going to read one of the songs of ascent, but we're not going to march anywhere. When I take people to Israel, I, in fact, I, uh, while I was studying this afternoon, I just popped onto Google and I put Psalms of Ascent to see what, you know, the all-knowing Google would say. You know what came right up? A picture of, uh, I, we are the only ones in the whole internet to have a picture of people walking up the steps. And, and I looked, and there was Bonnie walking up the steps. So while I was studying, I was distracted, uh, watching my wife walk up the steps to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But imagine you're there, and in this psalm is how you would prepare your heart to come before God. Because at the top of the stairs back then was the entryway to walk in to the temple itself. And this is how they prepared their hearts. Follow along with me, the 132nd Psalm. Lord, 
remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. See the resolve thing. He's making these promises. And here they are. So this is the start of those resolves. Verse 3. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids. Verse 5. Until I find a place for the Lord. Wow. A dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. You know what David said? What we used to say when I was a camper at Camp Barakel. No Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bunk. He said, only he said a little more eloquently. <laughs> he said, I'm going to find a place for the Lord. Verse 6, behold, we heard it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priest be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David. He will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish." 132nd Psalm. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, I thank you that we can read uh, these 3,000-year-old words. Thank you for preserving them for us. Thank you for recording them for us, that they're not like any other words, that they're actually breathed out by you, that you breathed out words that have meaning, and also that can sanctify us and change us and feed our souls. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word, so our faith can begin and can grow and can flourish through your word. Make us men and women of God who, like David, have a holy resolve to make place, make room, find time in our life for you. And Lord, I pray that that would be exhibited at this communion as we celebrate one of the two ordinances that you left for your church. You commanded that they be practiced until you come, and so we obey and we have gathered, and you are here, and you are coming to examine us at your table. And what a very special time this is, among the most special of all the services we could ever attend, when we come to your table, sitting across from you, and you commune with us. Bless this time. Open our hearts to your word. Teach us from David's resolves, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I'd like to just go through this 132nd Psalm with you. If David wrote this Psalm, as I said, it may flow from his youth. Uh, however it came, it really reflects his youth. Uh, it's possible, one feeling I have is that, that when David was given the Deuteronomy 17, remember last week we looked at that, kind of the marching orders as a king, it could be from that intense Bible study that he had to do that, that it reminded him of, of this habit, this resolve of his early life. And, and so it could be from there because David would have profited from his Bible study. And this psalm may have been prompted when David saw what God expected from him as king. Now, for just a moment, turn back to Deuteronomy 17. That's where we ended last time. And I want to show you, it's the fifth book, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Look at chapter 17, starting in the uh, uh, 18th verse. It's a record, and we, we spent the entire evening on it last week, but it's, it's what David did. We know that David was so desiring to honor the Lord. We know he did this. Because this is, is in the Bible that he read, and he was reading this word, and he was commenting on talking about it. And so he would have known 
that this was God's expectation. If you remember, it says in verse 18, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that's when you become king, write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites. And you notice he cites that in Psalm 132. He talks about the tent, the tabernacle, the priests, and all that. And so it was on his mind. And it shall be with him, verse 19 of Deuteronomy 17, and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and, careful, and be careful to observe all the words of the law and these statutes. And the practical work, it says in verse 20, so his heart would not be lifted up, it would help him to be humble um, above his brethren, he wouldn't feel above them, and that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or left, he would be submissive like we talked this morning, he would be uh, seeking God's rule in his life, and that he would pro prolong his days in his kingdom and his children in the midst of Israel. And you notice he talks about that too in the 132nd Psalm. It talks about his children, his children sitting on the throne and his descendants. So this portion of Deuteronomy 17 is, is in the background of the 132nd Psalm. Either David intentionally wrote it and reflected that, or those who were inspired by God through God's understanding of what was going on in David's heart recorded that. But whichever way it came to us, it's reflective of this. And so this psalm could be called David's spiritual secret. Now I want you to think about that. What is it that prompted this man to be the man that God says, I know that David will fulfill my purposes, that he will do my will. What prompted that? Well, Psalm 132 captures what I believe were the motivations, the resolves down deep in David's heart. So let's go back to the 132nd Psalm, and before communion tonight, let's just walk through, and I just want to show you four very, very clear resolves that David made. And these key truths we can glean from the words of the 132nd Psalm. The first one is what I emphasize when we're reading. Look at Psalm 132, look at verse 3. David says, I won't go into my room, I won't jump into my bed, I won't even allow myself to take a nap or slumber to my eyelids, I'm not going to snooze and doze off here until I find a place for the Lord. The first holy resolve of David is he sought God ahead of his personal comforts. Now, that is that just me saying that goes against our culture. Most people, I mean, they, their comfort is what is the paramount consideration. Dave said, no, God. I want to put God ahead of my comfort. I'm going to make time for God a holy resolve in my life. And this is what we would call David's devotional life. Have you ever heard of someone saying, I'm having my devotions? Do you know what having devotions is? Having devotion starts with having, or having devotions with the S on the end, starts with having a devotion with no S on the end for God. The word devotions is reflective of devotion. And if I have a devotion for God, that means my heart is, is drawn irresistibly to him. Now I know that he irresistibly draws us by his grace, but I'm talking about my response, that we long after God. With my whole heart have I sought thee, is the way the scriptures put it. That devotion to our God prompts us to have our devotions. But sometimes people talk about devotions without being reflective of the devotion from the heart. David has it. Here it is. It was, he says, I mean, look how eloquently it's stated. I'm not going to go to my place of comfort. I'm not going to go to bed. I'm not going to rest my body. I'm not going to close my eyes that are burning after a long day until I find a place for the Lord. And not just find a place in my schedule, but a dwelling place. Now this is reflective of the book of Ephesians. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts, is how Paul put it in Ephesians 3, that Christ may dwell you know what that word means? To be at home and to be comfortable. The Lord wants to be at home in our life. Um, I remember uh, early on that uh, Bonnie and I, we used to, when we were in California, we would, we would host a lot of people. 
And, and we used to, we had 864 people in our Sunday school class. I mean, that was a healthy size Sunday school class, and they were all senior citizens. So we would have the, however many of them had their birthday every month, just divide 864 by 12, and you got 70, right? Uh, there were a lot of them. And we would invite all the birthday people for their month to our house. And what we found is there were two kinds of guests. They're the guests that came for the party, came for the scripture, came for the fun time and everything the body made, and they would leave. There were others that wouldn't leave. They hung around. And so I got very adept at getting out the sweeper, you know, and pretty soon they realized it was time to go. And you know, you can help people know it's time to go. You can make them feel what? Uncomfortable. Now look at what, what David said. I am not going to be comfortable until the Lord finds a comfortable place in my life. You see, sometimes the Lord isn't comfortable. We're, we're, so, we're sweeping and we're doing our stuff in our life and, and our time for the Lord is like this. Okay, that's all the time you get, Lord. I hope I get something from it. You know, we just, and, and that's good. If you're down to 15 second devotions, that's better than none. But that isn't finding. Look what it says in verse five. Until I find a place. That, that speaks of a, of a secure resting place, until I find a place, a dwelling place, a place where the Lord feels comfortable that's His in my life. Number one, is time with God a holy resolve in your life? Or is it still hit or miss? Now, eating is regular. Sleeping is semi-regular. Work should be pretty regular. School, you know, you kind of have to go... But those things, you know, we kind of say are given. But is God right in there? And is he paramount first? Is he, is he the one who receives our first love, the priority love? That's critical. Without regular, consistent, disciplined time alone with God, you and I will never amount to anything for eternity. You see, either we are being, Romans 12, 1, squashed into the mold of the world, or through the word of God, we're being transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. It's going on. Either the pressure is squeezing us into world-likeness, or the word is conforming us to Christ-likeness. The choice is ours. And tonight, at communion. That's why it's so amazing we have Psalm 132 on this communion night. But tonight at communion is a good time to reaffirm or to make for the first time a holy resolve that, Lord, I'm going to seek you first. You say, well, I'm not a morning person. That's all right. You can seek him at night too. But you're supposed to begin your day. That's why the, the idea of orientation is you know how a person orients themselves? You know, they kind of wake up and they're reorienting. You know how the first thing we're supposed to orient to? God. When, when people are out sailing on the ocean, you, you, as soon as you can see a fixed point in the sky, a star, and a fixed point on the horizon, you mark those two and you can find where you are. That's celestial navigation. If you have those two, if you have the horizon and the star, and you get the angle and take your star chart and look where you are, you know right where you are. Did you know that this is the fixed point on the horizon and the Lord is the other one. And when you orient your life to the Lord through his word, you know right where you are. That's why it's so important to begin and end the day with him. Uh, and, and if you're a morning person, you might have your greatest time in the morning. And if you're really tired, you just spend a little time rehearsing with the Lord and thanking him. And, and if you're one of those knockout people and conk right out as soon as you hit the bed, then, then you just begin your day and end your day. And if you're one of those evening people that, that you just come alive from about nine o'clock on, then that's great. You just come alive. And, but when you get up in the next morning, you remind yourself and orient yourself for that day, because when we start our day, we make little choices. And this is one of David's resolves. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, we can't just live physically. The world does. That's why they're in this endless pursuit. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys a lot more places to look for it. And so they try and get all the money they can. They look for happiness. But the tree of happiness doesn't grow on a sin-cursed earth. And they can't find 
happiness, though they search their lifetime for it. Happiness is a byproduct of the Spirit of God making us complete. And so Jesus said, you can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from my mouth. So we can make holy resolves. And tonight we can say, by your grace, I will seek to be in your word every day. Now that's a a resolve you can make. And then you say, Lord, this is how I'll do it. I'll say, Lord, I'm going to read your Bible before I turn on my computer. I'm going to read your Bible before I check my messages. I'm going to read your word before I listen to anybody else's. I'm going to read your word before even I... And you can just pick. And you start making these, these personal choices to put the Lord above all else. And he'll honor that. He'll, he'll make your time with him so precious. Keep going in Psalm 132 to the, the second part and that's David talking about his childhood starting in verse 6 he said we heard of it in Ephrathah now if you read that you think of uh, of the Christmas story but thou O Bethlehem Ephrathah see it's the same it's it's talking about this location this this area around Bethlehem the fields that David was watching his flocks in he says it was there that I first heard about you we, we found it in the fields of the woods. Remember in the, the 19th Psalm, David talks about the heavens are declaring the glory of God. While he was out there protecting the sheep at night, he was looking at those stars, and he was communing with the creator of those stars. He's talking about that in verse 6. And then when he would come home with his family, his family would, would be going up for those three feasts that the Bible talked about. And he'd say, let us go to his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark. See, back then they didn't have a temple. They had a tent, and in the tent was the ark of the covenant. And you and the ark of your strength, and let your priests be clothed with righteousness. So David is thinking about this, this place. And, and you notice that, that he personally longed for God. He's talking about his job. He's out there in the fields. Look at verse 6. In the fields of the woods where he was a shepherd boy. And while he was out there, do you know what he was thinking about? He wasn't thinking about, how come I have to be out here with those sheep and all my friends are in town, you know, and they're, they're playing, they're fishing and all that stuff and I'm out here with these sheep. No. He's saying, God, I, out here in the fields, in the woods, I'm thinking about you. I can't wait to go to your tent. That was the visible manifestation of God. That was the epicenter of the worship of God, was at that tabernacle, that tent, that, that center of, of God's dwelling place on earth. David longed for God. He longed for God as a shepherd boy. His family probably kept the Sabbath and the feast, but David had an internal, personal longing in his heart for the Lord. You notice it wasn't just when his parents took him to the tabernacle, whenever that was. It was at when he was sitting alone. You see, he had a personal longing for the Lord. That was one of his resolves. He said, I I think about you all the time, oh God. I long for you. I want to go to where you are. Now the question for us tonight is, do you personally long for God and seek after God on your own? Or do your parents make you come? Does your wife, you know, say, come on, honey, aren't you going? Does your husband say, honey, come on? Do your kids say, we want to go, you know, we want to go to choir, come on, take us. You go, okay, you know, we can't leave the building, you're in the building, we'll sit there. Or do you have this, this resolve that I am going to personally long for God? That's a choice. Reality in spiritual life only comes when it is personal longing from my heart for God. And David had that. He put God ahead of his comfort, had that time for God, and he had a personal longing. Not just did he have that time set aside to find a dwelling place for the Lord, but he longed after God. It's a wonderful thought to think about pursuing after the Lord. Can you make a holy resolve tonight that you're going to seek the Lord through his word? You know, a lot of people just read the Bible. Kind of dry. They do it, though. 
They know they're supposed to. It's kind of like in our Bible study with the men. Uh, it's the castor oil stage. You know, you know you're supposed to do it, so you do. You know, just like when your mother, when you were little, used to give you that terrible tasting castor oil. You did it because it would make you well. You read the Bible because it helps you spiritually. But do you know what the next stage is, what David went to? He didn't just find a place for the Lord and, and do the, the routine. He longed for the Lord. He longed for, in fact, I thought about that today as I was driving home. We had a meeting after the service, and I was driving home down Red Arrow. And you know what I saw? I saw a lady riding a bicycle, talking on the cell phone, and smoking a cigarette at the same time. I'd never seen that before. I mean, she only had one hand on the handlebars. The other hand was alternating between the, riding a bike, mind you, down Red Arrow, alternate between holding the cell phone and getting a cigarette. I mean, it was quite ambidexterity going on there. But you know what I saw? She longed to talk to that person. And she was bound by her habit of cigarettes. And then she wanted to be healthy, so she was riding the bike. I mean, it's great. <laughs> great. Uh, but, but what do you long for? Because you do it. And I saw it this afternoon. But, but keep going. Look at verse 9. David has a third resolve. There are only four of them. In verse 9, he says, let your priests, remember he's talking, he's thinking about the ark and the tent and the tabernacle and Shiloh and all that, but he says, let your priest be clothed with righteousness and your saints shout for joy. But I, I, I stopped on that, clothed with righteousness. Think about that. David wanted, he was longing after God and, and when he when he said that, he says, let your priest be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. It was like he was merging in, thinking about when he went to the tent, those priests wore those white outfits. I mean, even though they were killing animals and getting blood on them, they kept changing them. So they always had these beautiful white outfits that, that reflected. It was an outward picture of what they were supposed to be. And you know what? David said, he didn't say, let your priests be clothed with white clothes. David saw what God really liked. He says, God, they wear those white clothes, but your priests should be clothed with what? Righteousness. And your saints, the word saints is one who is set aside in holiness. He says, that's, that's what he wanted to be. He wanted to be one of those in righteousness that was clothed in this righteousness this means that David wanted to live the Lord's way as much as possible. Consecration to the Lord was a choice David made. He wanted to come before the Lord like a holy priest. And isn't that what God says we are? Peter says you are a holy priesthood, a peculiar people, that you're set apart to God. We, we are God's priests. It's not a special class of people that, that goes around wearing unusual clothing anymore. That's the Old Testament. And that's one of the errors of the Roman Catholic Church. They've kind of frozen the Old Testament. And, and, and like the Old Testament, the priests wouldn't let people get near God. They protected God from, you know, being interrupted by people. The Roman Catholic Church has captured that Old Testament idea, and they don't let anybody get, you can't handle the Holy Eucharist. You can't. We're the guardians of it. And, and, and they are like the go-betweens with God, like the Old Testament. And they've missed the, the New Covenant. But David was seeing way beyond that. And he says, I want to come to the Lord like a holy priest. And God says, you and I are holy priests. And we spend our lives offering what we do as a holy sacrifice back to him. In fact, Romans 12 says our whole life. I beseech you, therefore, believers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, alive, but as a burnt offering back to God. That's what David wanted to be. He wanted to bring God the offering of his worship and deeds of sacrificial service. And that's what we're supposed to do. And tonight, at communion, it's not just taking this bread and cup and, and going through the rigmarole. It's actually making it an offering. Because you and I are priests of God. And we offer the fruit of our lips praising his name like a rising up incense offering to our God. David said, I want to be like that. I, I admire those priests. They wear the white stuff. I want to be clothed with righteousness. I admire your saints, and I want to be one of those saints that shouts for joy. See, he's extolling 
and we can see the backdrop of his heart longing for God. Well, this evening, do you realize you're clothed in Christ's righteousness? I just heard a testimony um, at a little prayer meeting of elders. It was really precious. Uh, one of the elders prayed, and he said, Lord, he said, you have all the sins I've ever committed, past, present, and future, and I have all of Christ's righteousness credited to my account. And he was stating the doctrine of justification in his prayer. And that's what David is alluding to. And the question is, are we living every day as a priest? Can we make a holy resolve like David tonight to live out 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20? You know what that says? What? Don't you know you were bought with a price? Your body is not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, as one that was purchased from God, glorify God with your body and your spirit because they're his. Our body is the temple. We're a priest and our body becomes the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. We're to live like a holy priest, like a consecrated servant of God. Well, look at the end of verse 9 and all the way through verse 16. This is what David says. He says, And your saints shout for joy at the end of verse 9. And then in verse 16, I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Verse 16. What David is reflective on here is there were times in the worship in that tabernacle where the Levites would come out and the Levites and the singers would come and the musicians would come and they would start playing the, the songs of worship to God and the people would get so excited that they would shout. You know, if you get over by the Jewish people, especially you go to the Western Wall, that's their gathering place in, in Jerusalem. It's where they kind of express their, their Jewishness as, as God's chosen people. They can't be there very long before you start hearing them going, da, 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 and they start singing these Hebrew songs, and men, arm in arm, are going round in circles, and, and the ladies are standing behind them clapping. They get so excited. You know what's amazing is they're singing verses from the Bible, and they don't even often know personally the God they're singing about, and they get excited about the thought of him from his holy scriptures and we know him and we're so calm about it have you ever thought about that have you ever thought about how how we know god and most of the rest of the world just know about him we know him david was engaged in corporate worship in verse 9 at the end, he talks to the plural saints. He was personally a seeker of the Lord. He was one of those saints. And that made him come into the congregation of the saints with such a zeal. In verse 16 says he wanted to shout to the Lord. He, wanted to, he didn't just want to say, oh, you're great, Lord. He wanted to be like that dad in the stands that goes, that's my, you know, when their child does something well in sports. That's my God, we say in worship. I know him. He bought me. I wonder, do you engage in corporate worship? Or do you just stand there and let it go by? Does your heart shout? I remember we had uh, an elder when we lived in Tulsa. He had some rare disease where it's kind of like um, his, it's kind of like osteoporosis only, max. Uh, his bones were like birds. I mean, he was very light and wispy. And all the calcium had come out. He just had like straw bones. And uh, the doctors told him that soon as weight, he was just going to crush, you know, because he, his body was cannibalizing itself, no matter all the supplements and everything he did. And, and he was this wispy, weak, you know, sick sometimes, wonderful, godly elder. And you know what he told me? He said, he, he said, I have low strength, low energy. He says, and I have to be real careful I don't bang against stuff and break, you know, my little feather, uh, straw bones, you know. But he says, when, when you preach about revelation, he says, when you preach about the throne, he says, he says I, I, can't, I can't sit still. And, and he used to be sometimes up in the balcony and you'd see him and he'd disappear. Because he would get down on his knees before the Lord. He would get down. He did it in the balcony so it wouldn't bother anybody, but he would get on his face before the Lord because he was one. Look what it says in verse 16. I will clothe her priests with salvation and her saints will shout aloud for joy. It, David is saying, 
I, I'm one that engages in worship. I don't just watch. I engage. And, and my friend, this, this elder, engaged. I wonder this, this evening, does your face radiate a deep love for the Lord when we look up at the screen and sing those songs? Or does it show distraction, disconnection, and an air of indifference about the Almighty? If you think about it, heaven is God giving everybody what they really want. People on earth that don't want God, they don't want anything to do with Him, they don't have any time for Him. In fact, they, the only thing they can do with His name is curse it. He'll give them that. They can spend their life forever departing as a cursed one. But if you can't get enough of God, and if you long for Him, and, and, and if you engage, and whenever there's an opportunity to worship, you want to be there because it's so... I mean, you, know, you are His fan. You know, I saw, remember I was watching the gum-chewing, distracted checker at Hardings. Do you know what else I saw at Hardings? If you wear a Western Michigan, you know, anything for Western, you get 5% off. You know what they're, they're cultivating fans. Are you a fan of God? Are you cultivating? Are you disinterested, indifferent, distracted, disconnected? Communion is where we renew our connection. So what we're going to do tonight we're going to do two things. It's a little scary. It's 6.58. We have 17 minutes. Sunday night crowd, the elders told me, is the, the real, you know, the family. You know, we have all kinds of people Sunday morning, but the real serious ones are here tonight. So we do other things that are different. So what we're going to do is two things tonight. The first one is open to Matthew 4.4. 4. And before we dismiss the men to bring the bread to us, look at Matthew 4.4. 4. And what I would like you to do is take about three minutes, and read Matthew 4.4, 4, and right where you're seated, look at those verses, and ask yourself, after you spend a little time in prayer, in fact, even, you know, if you're real agile, you get on your knees, but don't be wild, you know, don't do anything unusual, uh, don't get down if you can't get back up, um, you might want to settle this resolve for the word in your life. Did you know you'll never start being with the Lord every day in his word if you don't resolve in your heart that you're going to change something if you don't do that. And if you already do it, it's a time to renew that and say, Lord, I, I not only am going to be in your word, but I'm going to stay in it until I, I actually see and worship and, and pursue you. I'm not just going to read it anymore. I'm just going to I'm going to love you through your word. But take a little while, read Matthew 4.4, 4, and then make a holy resolve, something like this. By your grace, I will seek to be in your word daily. Okay? Three minutes. At the end of that, I'll pray, and when I pray, I'm going to dismiss the elders and deacons to prepare. Okay? So let's bow our heads, uh, look at the Bible, pray. If you want to get on your knees, but you got three minutes. Okay? And let's make a holy resolve to the Lord.